Hello everyone. I am here again with the new lecture for the paper of literary criticism. As this paper seems somewhat difficult to the students in the comparison of poetry, drama, fiction, I'll try my best to clarify the topic of criticism in the simplest and comprehensible way. So let's start to discuss about Wordsworth as a critic. At first, it should be clear to you that Wordsworth was basically a poet, not a critic. He was dragged into criticism in spite of himself. His upbringing in the lap of nature was not conductive to a critical frame of mind. Actually, what happened in 18th century, which is known as neoclassical age, which was the age of great poets also like Alexander Pope and Dr. Johnson, who was also a critic, there were set rules, standard meters, standard rhyme scheme, standard stanza form, like hero heroic couplet, etc. We can say that a kind of poetry they wrote was only ideas versified. In such monotonous literary background, Wordsworth played the vital role which can be summarized in the words of Hamlet, who says, the time is out of joint, O oh, cursed despite, that ever I was born to set it right. Actually, the romantic spirit of Wordsworth compelled him to set the direction of literature in the right side. He revolted against the boredom of neoclassical rules and heralded a new era of romanticism with the publication of lyrical ballads in 17. 98. Lyrical Ballads is actually a collection of 23 points. Four written by S.T. Coleridge and 19 are of Wordsworth. The first poem of Lyrical Ballads is The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner by Coleridge and the last one is Tintern Abbey by Wordsworth. Actually, this publication was an experiment to break the artificiality, triviality, over-elaborations and lofty style of neoclassicists. They, they cared for only for rules, methods, outward form and had nothing to say about substance or you can say the soul of the poetry. On the contrary, Wordsworth developed the romantic conception that poetry is true voice of feelings, not a commentary on the uh, pervading things. He gave free expression to his feelings and his thoughts in his poems uh, fluently. He believed that the poet must focus only on the simplicity of life because true emotions develop always in the natural behavior of man. But unfortunately, this experiment was violently attacked by the neoclassical critics. Had it not been happened, uh, point to be noted here, uh, listen to carefully, had it not been happened, means had he not been criticized by the critics, it is doubtful whether he would have penned a single line of criticism. He had to enter the realm of criticism only because of self-defense. The chief of his critical papers is the preface which was composed is, uh, in the second edition of Lyrical Ballads dated 1800, which was revised and enlarged in the subsequent editions of uh, 1802 and 1815. In all of them, Wordsworth's motto was only to clarify poetic diction, language and theory of poetry. In the preface, he explains that the principal object of the poem is to choose incidents and situations from common life and to relate or describe them throughout as far as possible in a selection of language really used by men. Now, elaborating why only low and rustic life was chosen for this purpose, he says, he explains it. That in that condition, free from all outside influence, men speak from their own personal experience and convey their feelings and notions in simple and unelaborated expressions. 
From this, he is led to attack the elevated diction of the day, means of neoclassical age. He lays emphasis on to adopting the very language of man. In poetic diction, we cite the use of personification. Wordsworth includes phrases and figures of his speech, which from father to son have long been regarded as the common inheritance of poets. Finally, he points out that the language of the poetry is pursed naturally in the simple language of the people. High phraseology and archaic make the poetry artificial and pedantic. There are scores of poems like Lucy Gray, Solitary Reaper, Michael, etc., which triumphantly vindicate his theory of poetic diction. He took the old stock of the language of poetry and cleared out a lot of rubbish, whatever he thinks so. In, this in his definition of poetry, he emphasizes the true nature of poetic composition and so deals a death blow to the dry intellectuality of contemporary poetry. He says, poetry is the spontaneous overflow of powerful feelings it takes its origin from the emotions recollected in tranquility. Now, according to it, there are at least four stages through which an experience has to pass before a successful composition uh, and uh, the poetic creation. First of all, there should be the observation or perception, you can say, of some object, character or incident which sets up powerful emotions in the mind of the poet. And secondly, there is the recollection or you can say contemplation of that emotion in tranquility, in utter peace, in calm mood. And thirdly, the interrogation of memory by the poet revives the emotion in the mind itself. And the last stage, the fourth stage is the stage of composition. The poet must convey that overbalance of pleasure and his own state of enjoyment to others. He uh, plainly explains that. And yes, meter is also justified and recommended by him as he declares verse will be read a hundred times where prose is read only once. Wordsworth closely follows this theory of poetry in his poems. The Prelude, Daffodils, Tintin Abbey, Solitary Reaper, all of them resulted from emotions recollected in tranquility. For example, uh, in the, uh, to the cuckoo, he writes of his memories that the voice of the cuckoo awakens recollection of his school days and that golden time again. In the same way, a host of daffodils seen one April morning becomes the embodiment of a spiritual joy in later moments of calm mood. The imaginative expression and recollection are converted into poetic form. He uh, says in the poem of Daffodils, uh, For oft when on my couch I lie in vacant or in pensive mood, they flash upon that inward eye which is the bliss of solitude. It will be noted here that through the spontaneous overflow of feelings and emotions recollected in tranquility, they are paradoxical to each other. The, uh, the one coming on sudden and other deliberately recalled to memory. They seem paradoxical, but in fact, he makes no difference between the two. He endeavors to explain the one by the other. Actually, Wordsworth is describing his own experience of writing poetry in his criticism. Its creation is spontaneous, yet simultaneously controlled and disciplined by the conscious judgment of the poet. It is not the question of either or, but both demands uh, its opposite. He says poetry is like a magnet. It cannot exist without both poles. He concludes again that poetry is the breath and finer spirit of all knowledge. Finally, poetry for him is a great force for good. His own object in writing poetry was to console the afflicted, to add sunshine to daylight by making the happy happier. And after then, he drew the general conclusion that every great poet is a teacher. 
In this reference, he may be said to follow Plato and Horace. In the preface, benign tendencies in human nature and society are defined as relationship and love, which is the great function of poetry to promote. But they are to be induced through a purgation of feelings rather than through a mere appeal to the intellect or good sense. This is what distinguishes Wordsworth's concept of teaching from that of his neoclassical predecessors. In this way, he succeeds in enlarging the range of English poetry through his criticism, which has historical significance. By advocating freedom, spontaneity, imagination, innovation and romanticism, he brings about a revolution in the theory of poetry and makes popular acceptance of the new romantic poetry possible. So this was a short effort to describe Wordsworth as a critic. I hope it will help you to comprehend the topic in easier way. Meet you in the next lecture. Till then, thank you.